Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, as I'm sure you all know, because you think of nothing else, today is day seven of the committee stage of the EU withdrawal bill. Yeah, I'm sure you've had that date in your diary for a long while. I know I have. But before your eyelids really do close shut, and I think mine just did, I should explain that today's debate could result in a damaging defeat for the government over its flagship Brexit bill. Tory rebels, they're backed by Labour, are demanding that Parliament be given what's called a meaningful vote, implying most of their other votes aren't meaningful, on the final Brexit deal. So what does that mean, meaningful? You no idea? Neither do I. But Elizabeth Glinka is here to explain. Thank you very much, Andrew. Right, the European Union withdrawal bill is a key part of the government's Brexit strategy. It'll repeal the 1972 Communities Act, ending the supremacy of EU law and copying that existing EU law onto the UK statute book. Over 350 amendments and 75 new clauses were put forward, but the government has yet to lose a vote and so far the bill remains unamended. Now, MPs could vote this evening on an amendment tabled by Tory MP Dominic Grieve, calling for a meaningful vote on the final Brexit deal. Mr Grieve says his amendment would make it possible for Parliament to say to the government, I'm sorry, I don't think you've negotiated a good enough deal. Now, the Labour Party says it will support the amendment if it comes to a vote, with Shadow Brexit Secretary Keir Starmer tweeting, the terms of our future are not for the government alone to determine. And around 20 other Tory MPs are reported to support Grieve's amendment. But the government is trying to head off the rebellion, with Brexit Secretary David Davis writing to Tory MPs this morning, committing the government to holding a vote on the final deal in Parliament as soon as possible after the negotiations conclude. This vote, he says, would cover both the withdrawal agreement and the terms of the UK's future relationship with the EU. He pledges that the government would not implement any parts of the withdrawal agreement until the vote has taken place. Andrew. Thank you for that. Now, joining me from Central Lobby in Parliament is the Conservative MP Heidi Allen. She's one of those who says she will vote for Mr Greaves' amendment and therefore against uh, the government. Heidi Allen, David Davis has said that there will be a vote on the deal when it's made, if and when it's made. There will be a vote of the House so demands on the treaty and there will be a legislation on the withdrawal and implementation process. Why is that not enough? Because without being disrespectful, because I know this is difficult, we've heard that before. We actually need this um, amendment to be accepted by the government this evening so that that vote can be meaningful and well-timed because currently the way the legislation stands, um, our vote could come afterwards. So a written statement is a good step in the right direction, but we need it to be legislatively binding. And that means a vote, um, so that, as Dominic has rightly said, so that if the deal isn't good enough, we can push back. But equally, this written statement this morning doesn't give us any um, fallback plan if there is no deal at all. Now, clearly phase one negotiations have gone well, and that's unlikely. But as I keep saying to people, you know, political tectonic plates are shifting like we've never seen before. Um, anything is possible. And we just want the very best possible outcome for this country. We accept right. we're leaving, um, but okay. we just don't want to bind our hands. But more important from what you've just told our viewers, you do not trust a written ministerial statement from a Minister of the Crown in your own government? It's not about that. It's a complicated process. And, you know, the dynamics, as I say, are shifting all the time. You know, the government is determined... Yeah, yeah, well, you said you'd heard it all before, uh, which implies you don't trust it. Well, what it, he, what, what it, he's saying, why don't you trust a Minister of your own government? Because the timing can change. And as I say, the written ministerial statement doesn't deal with a situation where there might not be um, a deal brokered at all. Um, so it only sort of fixes half the problem. Dominic's Amendment 7, you know, is a very knowledgeable guy. This is an ex-Attorney General, not a, not a mutineer, not a serial rebel. He, he says the legislation is not strong enough to protect our country, then I believe he is absolutely right. And the government, which we, we know we still hope, there's a good nine hours yet to go today, we're still hoping that the government mm. will be able to improve on that written statement. 
and accept our amendment or put something in you know, a similar format into the bill themselves. But let me just ask for clarification again because I don't quite understand what more you want. The government has committed to having a vote on the deal. It's committed to having a vote on the treaty. It's committed to having legislation to implement the deal. I think people will not understand why a Conservative doesn't find that enough. Because it's about the timing. You know, when will that deal be ratified? When will Parliament get a vote? Will there be enough time? Um, you know, particularly we have another amendment that the government themselves have tabled next week, which suggests they want to put a drop dead date of leaving on the bill. This is just getting too tight for time. We just think we should slow the process down. This is, at the end of the day, this is a piece of legislation. This is what Parliament and MPs are here to do, to scrutinise and vote right. on it. So what we're asking is not extraordinary, it's perfectly reasonable. Well, don't stick with us, Heidi Allen, because we've got George Eustace of the government here. Why shouldn't Heidi Allen get what she wants? Well, because we've addressed all of the concerns that she's raised with the announcement today. And I think what I would just say, stepping back, look, this debate uh, about uh, the referendum last year was a divisive debate. It divided the country. And we've got a big responsibility in Parliament now, whichever side we're on, I was on the Leave side, to actually uh, put the country together. And Parliament's got a responsibility to drive out the necessary compromises uh, to get an agreement. That's the process that's going on now. We've had the bill on triggering... Our no, no, we've had all that. But direct yourself... Direct, I okay, so to direct the, to well, on the direct, Heidi, on the direct Heidi point, um, what we've made clear clear today uh, is that um, when that um, withdrawal agreement is concluded, likely to be in October, that's what Michel Barnier said, there's a timetable they're working to, uh, that will be laid before Parliament in the usual way and Parliament's got an opportunity then to effectively pray against it, to pass a resolution against mm. it, the actual terms of the uh, treaty that's put before them. Uh, if they don't do that and they accept it, as we hope they will, there will then be a bill, another bill, a bill on uh, EU withdrawal and how we implement the EU withdrawal agreement and covering right. things like the transition. So Parliament's going to have okay. exhaustive opportunities so, to discuss all of this. So, so you, you won't move, the government won't move on its position? Well, the government's listened very carefully to Parliament yeah. and it's addressed all of the concerns raised so it won't by move. people like Heidi Allen, people like Dominic Grieve, uh, with this announcement today. Wait, if and when it does move around five or six o'clock tonight, can we play this a bit back to you? Uh, all I'm saying is we've addressed this. They're going to, uh, if Heidi wants to debate this, she's got plenty of opportunity, plenty of opportunity well, to she... pray against the uh, treaty when it's agreed. And no, then no, after we've that... Made that but Heidi Allen, what do you say to George Eustace? Well, I say first of all, Andrew, thank you. You're behaving a little bit like a relate councillor. So that's really appreciated. Um, I say, Not as you know, well paid, though. <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, you know, the, the government have moved. We saw it yesterday with the Henry VIII powers, and that was so welcome, and the government absolutely are listening. I suppose, you know, reflecting on what he's just said, he is right. This has been so divisive for our country. But, you know, giving Parliament a vote at the right time on every um, thing that may come forward, you know, whether that's no deal as well, as I say, this um, written statement but, still doesn't cover that, then this is how we heal the country, right. by those people who voted Remain as well right. as Brexit having a voice right. in this Parliament, and that is but our job. You had your chance to do all this when, when the Article 50 legislation of the vote came up which triggered the whole process. Why didn't you try to amend that then? That's what started the process. You could have put this into that process at the time. Why not? I don't think that was the right time because that would, you know, that was the, the starting gun for leaving the EU. And that's one thing that every single one of us that are backing Dominic today are also very clear about. We are not trying to stop Brexit. You know, voting or trying to change Article 50, that piece of legislation, would have, I think, looked very clearly like we were trying to stop it. And that's not right. And that is disloyal to the people in this country who, by the referendum, asked us to leave the EU. So that was not the right time. This is now about the detail but, and making sure that that deal is the right one. But if... If Parliament voted against a deal, if a deal is done, if Parliament voted against that deal, uh, that would effectively be a vote of no confidence in the government at the beginning of a constitutional crisis. No, I disagree. Which you would probably welcome because you might be able to reverse the result. Not at all. That's, uh, you know. 100% not the case at all. Um, this is just about making sure you know we have the right deal. The European Parliament will get to vote on whether the withdrawal deal. Well, so uh, will the British Parliament. But but not if there is no deal. And I don't well, believe in a timely enough but fashion. How can you have a vote on a deal if there's no deal? Well, and, and that's the point. This is the entire well, what reason. Do you, well, what do you want? You cannot vote on a deal if there's no deal. So so that's not what David Davis was addressing. What do you think should happen if there's no deal? We think Parliament should be able to have the opportunity to say the deal is good enough, the deal isn't. Go back, see if we can have more time to get a better deal. I believe both sides of this equation, the UK and Europe, do want a deal. 
But you know, these things can take time. Negotiations don't always happen to the time scale that you. Well, why do hoping you think the other 27 members would want to extend this process? They're already getting fed up with it. Because if we haven't reached a deal that is good for both sides, you know, our economies rely well, on each other. It's really important. But, our science, our healthcare relies on each but other. But the other 27 won't have agreed to the deal if they don't think it's good for them. But precisely, and that's the whole point. So therefore, you won't have, have a deal. The, but we should have the same <laughs> right. It's pantomime season. Come early today. I just we're, we're <laughs> overcomplicating. This. this is about Parliament and MPs doing their job to scrutinise right. this piece of legislation like any we, other. We better let you get into Prime Minister's questions. Thank you. Hi, yeah, thanks for joining us before. And, uh, Jenny Chapman, you, you, Labour will vote with the Tory rebels tonight? Yes, I mean, we'd vote for Dominic Greaves' amendment right. if it should go to a vote. We Which have it a... probably will, I would think. I, I hope so. I hope it does go to a vote. It's still. I expect that he is still waiting to hear what the minister says. Mm. Um, it, to see if there's some movement in his direction. It is direction. possible that the, it's the threat of a rebellion can sometimes be as powerful as the rebellion itself. But we would certainly vote with Dominic. Will there be a, we is there a three-line whip on this amendment on the Labour side? Oh yes, absolutely. So, yes. How many? of your colleagues will ignore that? Oh, well, there's usually about seven, as you know, because we have this conversation a lot, who... I, I don't remember, oh, but I have well, so many. It's, it's, so uh, there's about seven, but some may not turn up as well. Who won't turn up? I don't know, but some may not. I mean, it's possible they won't. I mean, you never know. Whipping is, it's not an absolute, you know, exact science, but there is a whip on. We expect that we would have enough to defeat the government should the Tory rebels stay true to what they've indicated. And you get a solid Labour turnout? Yes. As things stand at the moment, do you expect to win or lose? Uh, look, we're, uh, the, all of these uh, amendments we've won so far, um, we're listening to Parliament, though, and we've addressed all the concerns that Dominic so raised. So you are raised. getting ready to move? We are ready to uh, win this vote, and I think what we've ah. done today uh, has, allowed, has outlined exactly how we would do that. Right. I mean, there's nothing... Uh, but, you know, but will you win the vote with what you've already said, uh, 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 or do you need to say more to no, win the I, vote? I think what we've done covers it, because there will be a vote on the treaty itself, just under our normal parliamentary procedure. So they're going to get that vote. And then uh, not only is there a vote on the agreement, there's a whole bill on the agreement, no, so they no, can argue over that, that infinitum. I mean, the so, Parliament has an insatiable appetite so to discuss this. So that's it. You've listened, you've made your uh, statement, and it's now do I've, your worst, Rebels. Well, I've not heard anything from Heidi Allen that's explained why what we've outlined today doesn't do what she wants. It gives them not only a meaningful vote, but an entire bill uh, on it. It does address the issue. If there was no deal, what would happen? Well, if there's, there, we're going to get a deal. We're working. We've passed you know, the, the I first. Know, I understand that. The point but is, there, though, there is. It's a point Heidi Allen raised. It's not me. I know. She, well, let the, me make if a. If there is no deal, what would I do? We still leave. Is that right? Well, let me make a counterpoint. We will get a deal if uh, the other side know that we're serious about leaving, and that's why part of our planning is always planning for a no deal scenario. You have to be willing to do that, otherwise you're not taken seriously. If our European partners basically see, um, you know, people back here that they may be playing a game to try and stay in the EU. Um, uh, they're not going to negotiate oh. properly with us. So we do have to be uh, serious here yeah. that we want a partnership that answers right. those who are but, concerned uh, but about that, but we are clear I, that we're I going asked to leave. something simpler. What would happen if there's no deal? If there's no deal? Well, if there's no deal, we're planning for a no-deal scenario and you come out yeah, of the and EU we leave under, anyway. um, you know, Does WTO Parliament get a vote scenario? on that? Um, Parliament can vote on anything it wants at any time it wants, but we've triggered Article 50 and we are going to get a deal. And right. we, we, we're, right. It's but if, frustrating but, 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 for people on, on both is, sides. This is still important, because if there is no deal, what is then the role of Parliament? Parliament's got it, the role it's always got. It can put down amendments, it can put down motions, it can do... Well, it can't amend something that doesn't exist, can it? Well, um, look, the, um, we are going to get this withdrawal bill through and then there'll be a vote on the withdrawal bill, an endless debate right. about how we implement Very it. Very well. It, again, it's not what I asked, but it's clearly all I'm going to get. In the next hour or so, Theresa May faces a crunch vote on her Brexit plans. Several of her own MPs have joined Labour in demanding Parliament has the power to send ministers back to the negotiating table if it doesn't like the final deal between the UK and the EU. So far, the Prime Minister has offered what she's called a meaningful vote. But is that enough or will she have to make a concession in order to avoid a defeat? 
Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, is in Westminster for us. Laura. Thank you, George. Well, there's been a lot of fuss, a lot of froth. What this is really about is how much power is the government willing to give MPs over the final Brexit deal? Now, for a long time, ministers have said, of course you'll have a vote. Of course it will be meaningful. Of course you will have a say. But the Labour Party, the SNP, the Lib Dems and a crucial group of Tory potential rebels want a legal promise now that they will not just have a vote, but they'll have a vote before the deal is signed. Now, the numbers look extremely tight, but it's possible that the government will tonight be forced to do so. But it's the determination of the Tory rebels that will really make the difference. Look at the Chancellor's little list. At the top of a sheaf of papers, the names of the Tory rebels who might beat their party bosses tonight. Nikki, Anna, Dominic and the rest. Only their first names, those former ministers who've been trying for weeks to have their say. Even at this last moment, would she be so good as to accept the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman's Amendment 7 in the spirit of unity for everybody here and in the country? We will ensure that there is a meaningful vote on this, uh, in this House. There will then, of course, be an opportunity for Parliament to look at the Withdrawal Agreement and Implementation Bill. What does that all mean? Well, about 20 Tory MPs, the opposition parties and these hardy campaigners are demanding so-called Amendment 7. That's a legal promise from the government today that MPs will have the chance to vote and debate the deal between Britain and the rest of the EU, and crucially, before it's signed. Stop Brexit. OK, all right. Thank you, Peter. The government says there'll be a vote, but there isn't much trust they'll stick to that. And the former Attorney General, who's leading the charge, says it's got rough. Large numbers of people telling one that one's a traitor. Some, I have to say with regret, of one's honourable and right honourable friends saying things which I find slightly startling. I know he's engaging in this very seriously and very constructively, and he's frustrated about it, but there is no getting around the timing issue that we've got. This whole debate is about whether honourable and right honourable members are content that Parliament be a spectator, a passive observer into one of the most important decisions that has faced our country in generations. Ministers and Brexiteers are adamant they shouldn't budge. But it's bad-tempered. Look at this row inside the same political party. This article, um, Clause 9, is not about implementing leaving the European Union. It's about... Read it! Read it! Sit down! I'm not capable of hearing um, what my yeah, honourable cool. friend is saying because there seems to be an inordinate racket behind me being made by one of my colleagues. But there's the deep suspicion. Those who wanted to stay in the EU are trying to rerun the referendum. If people in this House use that amendment for those purposes, the backlash from the British public will be like none seen before, and he should beware of that consequence. And the idea that this somehow undermines the referendum decision is just a load of rubbish, and he well knows it. And if he had any better arguments, he would put them, rather than using something that is so ridiculous. But it's a standoff so far. The Downing Street machine determined not to move. Instead, an offensive, maybe with charm, to talk the rebels round. What's it going to take? Not much sign, though, so far. They're in any mood to back down. If I'm frank, it's pretty unpleasant. Uh, I never hope to be in this situation. But I, you know, I think that a number of us have made the point for the last uh, probably three months that this is the amendment that we think is incredibly important. This clash has been brewing for weeks. If number 10 loses, it would be the first time Theresa May has been beaten this way. Has the government done enough to beat the rebels? But the moment for arm twisting and arguments is nearly gone. Now, the vote is expected at around 7 o'clock, and I hear in the last couple of minutes, just along there, three of the key rebels have actually just left the Commons Chamber, apparently after they were passed a note from one of Theresa May's most important aides. So there is a chance that some last-minute skullduggery could mean a concession from the government or a compromise on behalf of the rebels. But it may well be, George, in the last hour that Theresa May is beaten in the House of Commons on her own plans. That would be the first time this has happened since she has been in power and on the eve of that vital EU summit in Brussels 
frankly, it would be a blow to her authority that she could well do without. Laura, thank you very much. Ministers have tonight promised new limits on government powers in the Brexit bill in a bid to see off a Tory rebellion. They want to be able to vote on a Brexit deal before it's signed with the EU. Political correspondent Romney Weeks is at the House of Commons where a crunch vote will take place very soon. So, Romney, is the government going to lose on this? Well, Mary, the signs are it's nail-bitingly close for the government. To give you an idea of how heated it's been in there this afternoon, on the Tory side, there's been talk of treachery, of sabotaging the will of the people, even invoking the spirit of Churchill and putting country before party. Dominic Grieve is the thorn-in-chief on the government's side. He wants it put into law that there will be a vote on the Brexit deal. His fellow rebel, Anna Soubry, put it to the Prime Minister this afternoon that she should back down and accept his proposal. The Prime Minister says she wants a meaningful vote on Brexit before we leave the European Union. Even at this last moment, would she be so good as to accept the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman's Amendment 7 in the spirit of unity? We will ensure that there is a meaningful vote on this, uh, in this House. There will then, of course, be an opportunity for Parliament to look at the Withdrawal Agreement and Implementation Bill. That shake of the head there, pretty clear signal that the rebels themselves are in no mood to back down. The government has made a last-minute concession which would limit the powers in the withdrawal bill until after there's a vote on the Brexit deal. It's not clear whether that will be enough to avoid a showdown. The vote is at seven. It looks like it's going to be on a knife edge. OK, interesting stuff, Romney. Thank you very much indeed. Well, now, MPs have just been voting as we speak on a series of amendments to Theresa May's flagship Brexit legislation amid a rebellion by Tory backbenchers, which could see the government facing defeat. Former Attorney General Dominic Grieve is demanding changes to the bill to require any final Brexit deal to be approved by a separate act of Parliament. We'll bring you the result of that crucial vote when we get it. First, our political editor, Gary Gibbon, has been watching the debate in Westminster. She'd bounced back, number 10 said, her fortunes revived by the last-minute pre-dawn deal in Brussels last Friday. But five days later, Theresa May found herself staring at the possibility of defeat in the Commons on Brexit. By Churchill's statue outside, a yes to Amendment 7 demonstration, a slogan perhaps not catch enough to pull big numbers. Inside, MPs from all sides of the House were backing an amendment that meant the government could not implement Brexit unless Parliament had voted for a special act of Parliament when negotiations finish. The Prime Minister's questions, Theresa May told a rebel Tory that plan risked Britain leaving the UK with a hole in the statute book. But as currently drafted, what the amendment says is that we shouldn't make any of those, put any of those arrangements, any of those statutory instruments into place until the withdrawal agreement and implementation bill has reached the statute book. That could be at a very late stage in the proceedings, which could mean that we are not able to have the orderly and smooth exit from the European Union that we wish to have. Tory rebels and opposition parties disagreed, saying passing a special bill at the end of the negotiation is the only way for Parliament to have a proper say on the shape of Brexit. There's a, there's a, time, there's a time for everybody to stand up and be counted. As Churchill said, he's a good party man. He puts the party before himself and the country before his party. And that's what I intend to do. Some Brexit supporters sniffed a conspiracy to stop Brexit altogether. This attempt to reverse Brexit offers an, offers an argument, offers an argument in favour of parliamentary sovereignty is nothing but cant. Oh my, what Stalinism is this, that somehow any attempt to disagree with the way in which this bill is drawn up is somehow a betrayal of Brexit. What rubbish! But some of the most fractious exchanges were between Tories. Um, clause 9 is not about implementing leaving the European Union. It's about... Read it! Read it! Read it! Sit down! It's about, it's about implementing a withdrawal agreement. I would beg my honourable right honourable friends on this. I mean, there's a, there's a summit tomorrow this is not the moment to try and defeat the government. Oh, from you! Oh, 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 
from you, one Tory shouted repeatedly, a reference to his record of rebelling against the government whip. Order! Order! The voting started after six hours of debate and even more activity outside the chamber as MPs were called in for high-pressure conversations with the government's most senior figures. The measure, clear the lobbies! One rebel complained they'd been treated like schoolchildren. That was them going out. They're back in the, the uh, result any moment now. Let's go straight to Gary Gibbon in Westminster. Gary. Just waiting for that crucial vote. It could be happening any minute now. It's been an extremely tense day. And what you're listening for when the votes are read out is uh, whether the eyes, that's the people voting for the rebel amendment, outnumber the noes. That's the government position. Uh, we should know that any minute. I can tell you it's been a bad-tempered uh, day. All sorts of claims of steamrollering, treating us like children, uh, accusations of treachery and cant and the rest of it. A last-minute concession may have bought the government a victory here, but we really don't know until we hear these numbers. The eyes to the right, 309. The nose to the left, 305. <laughs> So, there you are, the rebels have won. The government has been defeated by four votes. This is exactly what Theresa May didn't want. Remember, only at the end of last week, uh, she was talking about having she bounced back from an appalling period, and here she is having to cope with a defeat she dearly, dearly didn't want. I was talking to one supporter of this amendment uh, just before the vote, and he said what this vote means is that uh, so it's, a, a, it's locking in a legal requirement that the government does have a, a, a vote in Parliament on an act of Parliament uh, before a deal is signed. The way he put it to me was this allows Parliament, because you could put anything in the bill that you wanted, potentially, if it wanted to, to pause Brexit, to stop Brexit, he said. And he speculated maybe even to force the Prime Minister, if she lost uh, votes like that, uh, to have to go to the country and get another mandate. Now, that is at the uh, outer uh, realm of interpretation. There are other people who say this was simply trying to make sure that Parliament had a say in the entire process. But it's a reverse, a reverse the Prime Minister dearly didn't want, not least because tomorrow she goes to Brussels to try to uh, seal the deal that she uh, shook on last week. Uh, she doesn't want to look like a person who's not in control of her own government. And, of course, you've got the Cabinet and a Cabinet committee next week for the first time discussing where the government is going with the trade agreement ahead. Gary, I've no doubt we'll be back to you very soon, but uh, for the moment, thank you. Jackie. Well, earlier I spoke to the Luxembourg MEP and former Vice President of the European Commission, Viviane Redding, from Strasbourg. This morning she attacked Brexit in the European Parliament. They promised global Britain, instead they got a lonely Britain. They promised to take back control, instead they, have, they are spinning out of control. I am saddened that British people have fallen victim to political crooks and that the result is a divided and weakened UK. Well, her speech came on the day allegations emerged that the involvement of Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker had been covered up in a wiretapping scandal in Luxembourg, where he was Prime Minister for 25 years. The European Commission says it won't discuss alleged comments or alleged documents. Well, I started by asking Ms Redding if there's any reason to believe a quick trade deal could be agreed. Normally, the experience tells us that the deals on trade need a very long time. Uh, I give you the example uh, about the deal we have reached with Canada. We needed 10 years to uh, reach this, so I hope it will be more quick with Great Britain. You say you hope it will be quicker. Do you have any assessment of how long you think it might take? Well, that depends uh, on the two partners. At any rate, we cannot uh, make a deal with uh, Great Britain as long as Great Britain is a member of the European Union. So the divorce has to be completed before we can make a trade agreement with Britain. But it is in the EU's interest too that a trade deal is made quickly. The UK is the EU's biggest single market. Isn't the reality that you need us as much as we need you? I think uh, for to start with that it was a very bad idea that you wanted to leave and uh, that was not our idea, that was yours and unfortunately now we have uh, the procedures which are fixed in the European law. So what sort of deal do you anticipate? 
What do you think is the trade deal that will be at the end of all this? Probably uh, that will be a trade deal very similar to the one we have with Canada, uh, but this uh, has to be uh, settled also in the divorce procedure. We have also to see in this divorce procedure is, uh, if a transitional period is needed, uh, because the trade agreement cannot be made in a hurry and will need some time inclusive the ratification time and um, experience tells us that this is a very difficult deal to be reached. I mean the UK has made clear that they can anticipate a, a deal as you say like the one you have with Canada but they want financial services included. I mean is, is there any problem with that as far as you're concerned? Is that possible? Well, that means it will be a more difficult deal than with Canada because in the Canada deal services are not really included. It's a deal about products uh, more or less. So if we have to go further than Canada, then further work will be necessary. It's not going to be a quick fix. There has been some criticism in the European Parliament of the Brexit Secretary David Davis um, over his suggestion the deal wasn't legally binding. What's your view on that? This is very funny. That means uh, he will uh, suggest that his uh, Prime Minister, who has signed the deal in the name of the government, has no power to do so. Very strange. Um, can I just ask you, at this critical time, uh, uh, what do you make of the latest allegations concerning the Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker now involved in a criminal investigation over illegal wiretapping um, from the time when he was Prime Minister of Luxembourg. I mean, this is potentially very damaging, isn't it? That is not a very positive uh, thing uh, to happen, but it is an investigation which uh, goes uh, since very long time, and uh, he is uh, asked to testify in this criminal procedure. Vivian Redding, thank you very much for joining us today. Back now to tonight's breaking news. The government has suffered its first defeat over the Brexit bill after MPs backed a rebel Tory amendment calling for a meaningful vote on any final deal by a majority of four. This despite a dramatic last-minute concession. I am joined now by Eurosceptic Conservative MP Peter Bone. Peter Bone, is this a blow or are you perfectly sanguine about it? I'm sorry, I've just lost that question because the division bells have just okay. gone. Okay, don't you, don't you worry. Uh, how are you feeling about this vote? Well, it's always good when Parliament speaks and uh, a government has to listen, but in reality it's changed absolutely nothing. Um, there always is going to be a meaningful vote. Well, the good news is we're 411 days away from coming out of this dreadful European Union super state, and this vote will make not a blind bit of difference to it. Uh, so a meaningful vote is a meaningless vote? No, the meaningful vote was always guaranteed by the government. It was only... Uh, so that was the point. We are going to have a vote, and whether we... No, hang on a moment. It. Just let's just explore meaningful vote. You have been defeated and they have got a meaningful vote. What do you understand by a meaningful, meaningful vote? vote? is exactly what the government promised them in the first place, which is a vote on whether we actually accept the deal or not. And that will be prior to anything that goes to the, uh, to goes to the European Union for, for a ratification. But if we don't accept the deal, then we effectively will come out on WTO rules. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it, that, that's always been the government's position. So this, the hype about this vote has been totally over the top. But again, you know, if MPs uh, think they can't support the government on this, well, that's their decision and they'll have to face the... and explain to their constituents why they voted this way, which doesn't actually seem to be in accordance with what uh, the British people voted in the referendum. It's a big moment, Peter Bone, when a man who has been Attorney General in the past votes for the very first time in his life against the party he loves. Well, it's a shame we can't support the government. It's a shame we can't support getting the Brexit uh, deal that the British people mandated the government to do. That's his advice. He's in, he's in love with the European Union. That, that's his view. Um, you know, he, he has every right to vote which way he wants. So, so you have absolutely no uh, sense in which uh, this now reveals a party within your party? My goodness me. Uh, there's been divisions within both political parties over this issue for a very considerable amount of time. And, Those 14 uh, rebels were sitting together in a bunch. That's uh, the party within the party. Uh, well, I, the Labour Party is just as much divided as the Conservative on this. The one thing that I'm not going to do, though, is get the government to lose another vote because I'm chatting to you, so I'm really going to have to go off a vote. Sorry. Okay, very nice of you to talk to us, uh, right. Peter Bone. Good luck.
Well, more now on tonight's breaking news. The government's first defeat on the Brexit bill after an amendment by Tory rebels calling for a meaningful vote on the final withdrawal deal was approved by a majority of four votes. This despite a last-minute concession put forward by the Justice Minister, Dominic Raab, which rebels dismissed as too late. He joins us now. Dominic Raab, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Minister, are you going to uh, change anything? Well, good evening. Look, we've had countless votes. We're at the seventh day of eight days of committee stage. Obviously, we're disappointed to lose a vote by four votes. Um, but equally, this won't frustrate the Brexit preparations, and we're making sure we have a smooth Brexit when we leave the EU. Um, we want to make sure we've got the best legal toolkit in place to guarantee that legal certainty. We'll have another look and see in light of the amendment whether there are any further changes that need to be made. But this will not undermine the progress we've made or indeed the progress towards trade talks that in the coming days are going to be formally ratified. Uh, you talked about a legally, legal talk. What is the legal talk when it comes to meaningful vote? What does it mean? Well, we'd already committed to having uh, a vote on the withdrawal agreement that we agree with our EU friends and partners. The question is when we can start putting the legislative detail, the domestic preparations in place, when's the earliest we can start to do that? So it's really on this very finely balanced point, and it's a perfectly legitimate point, uh, getting through the volume of legislation but having the proper scrutiny. So it's a setback, uh, it's a minor setback, though it won't frustrate our preparations for Brexit, and we'll have another look to make sure that we've got the legal toolkit absolutely right at report stage. Well, well let's just, just clarify how small an incident this is then. I mean, uh, can MPs change the deal once it's been agreed in the negotiations? A meaningful vote would presumably allow them to make changes. No, look, it's totally unrealistic to think that after we've gone into negotiations with the EU, that there's anything other than an accept or reject decision for Parliament. This was about the uh, time frame for the scrutiny of the means of delivering on the agreement that we secure and we sign with our EU partners. So from the government's point of view, making sure that when we get the deal we need, we can properly comply with its obligations well, on but our then, side. Then you're saying that this is a very small thing, but this is a binary vote as far as you're concerned. It's either a yes or a no. And if, if MPs reject what has been negotiated, we crash out and there's no deal, correct? Well, I think it's um, a bit more complicated than that, but bottom line is we're going to leave the EU, we're going to make sure we've got proper parliamentary scrutiny, and Parliament's role, and it's going to be scrutinising all the detail, detail of this, will be yes to say whether they accept or don't accept the agreement at the end, and then to scrutinise and implement the de domestic legislation that allows us to give effect to that agreement. So, so, look, so this a whole setback, battle we'll about... This whole battle about sovereignty, the sovereign parliament will not be allowed a vote in which anything can be done to change the deal, and that the sovereign parliament will either have to reject and crash out or accept. Well, that's, that's been the... But that's what you've just told me, effectively. That's, sorry, John, let me, let me answer. That's the obvious, inevitable implication of the Article 50 legislation and Supreme Court ruling. And you couldn't have every member of Parliament trying to say, well, we want this, we want that, in the withdrawal agreement. And, of course, if we did allow that to happen, or if that was the situation, it would incentivise the EU to offer us a poor deal. So I don't think that's really an issue. What is at issue is the balance between the amount of legislation we've got to get in place with a small time frame and making sure Parliament can properly scrutinise it. This is a minor setback, but we'll look at it again. A minor setback. It's a precedent. You have just lost a vote on Brexit. No. And in other words, you do not at the moment enjoy a majority on Brexit. That puts you no, in John. a new situation. John, John, that's just totally wrong. We've won countless you, votes. No, We've you have lost this vote, which is critical. It's John, the first John, one. John, 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 I know you're very excited. I know you um, would love to well, see the thing disrupted. I think you're quite disrupted. excited too, Minister. Well, no, I'm not, this, these things I'm not, don't happen I'm, every day. I'm calm. I've been talking to colleagues in the House of Commons on all sides. We'll get this through. We'll get this done. And we've had lots of votes, and it's quite right Parliament expresses its views, and we'll continue to have constructive dialogue. This will not stop Brexit happening in March 2019. But what it does mean is we've got to look again to make sure that we've got the legislative toolkit in place to make sure we deliver the smooth Brexit, that whether you voted leave or whether you voted remain, uh, we all want to see. Dominic Raab, I'm grateful to you for turning out. Thank you very Thank you. much for talking to us. Thank you. Well, after a run of good headlines and just hours before she travels to the European Council in Brussels, the Prime Minister suffered her first proper defeat of this Parliament tonight. A vote on Amendment 7 to the EU Withdrawal Bill, giving MPs the power to vote on the withdrawal deal 
when it is ready. Well, the government says that could derail a smooth and timely Brexit, but it was a sign of how finely divided Parliament is that MPs split almost down the middle. But also a sign the Conservative Party has enough rebels, 11 uh, this evening, to obstruct the government's plans. What a day it was in the Commons. Would she be so good as to accept the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman's Amendment 7 in the spirit of unity for everybody here and in the country? I, I do find it quite entertaining that some who criticise me for speaking my mind on this matter are individuals who appear to have exercised the luxury of rebellion on many, many occasions. And the idea that this somehow undermines the referendum decision is just a load of rubbish. She talked about perhaps a delay of a couple of months. But if the treaty isn't right in the eyes of this Parliament, then a couple of months could turn into a couple of years. And indeed, in some cases, people would like it to be a couple of decades. The eyes to the right, 309. The nose to the left, 305. Well, at last, Parliament has asserted itself. The Prime Minister tried a power grab, tried to push through an EU withdrawal bill without proper parliamentary scrutiny. Well, the vote you saw there came around 7, just after 7 this evening, and within minutes, news emerged that one of the rebels, Stephen Hammond, had been sacked from his job as vice chair of the Conservative Party. Well, Dominic Grieve is a former Attorney General and the Conservative MP whose amendment it was that the rebels voted through tonight. Bernard Jenkin is a Brexit-supporting colleague of his from the back benches. We'll uh, talk to them in a moment. But first, our political editor, Nick Watt, is uh, with me. So, Nick, this was quite a moment. Um, quite a cock-up somewhere in the, in, in the way the government managed the whole business. Well, it? there are a lot of ministers who are being very, very critical of their own government in private this evening. I spoke to one minister who said, what we had were very clumsy and stupid late concessions by the government. Uh, another minister said to me, the whips should have known how very, very close this is. And a lot of criticism tonight of the chief whip, Julian Smith. Uh, one cabinet minister said to me, rule number one for a chief whip, know how to count. Mm -hmm. uh, another ex-cabinet minister told Julian Smith earlier this week, you are going to lose this vote unless you make some major concessions ahead of the vote and it's important to say that this is the second slip-up in two weeks by Julian Smith a lot of people saying that had his predecessor Gavin Williamson been in place who had excellent and close contacts with the DUP the Prime Minister would not have been so exposed to that meeting in Brussels um, last Monday for the, for the Remainers and you've spoken to some this evening the, the, the former Remainers or Remainers what, what, what is their take on how important this is? As a well, I saw one Remain minister this evening who had, I think it best to say, crocodile tears. Uh, another senior Remain figure I spoke to said, this is a very significant moment. And this person said to me, this is the canary in the coal mine. This is the moment when the government needs to accept there is no majority in this parliament for a hard Brexit. There is no majority in this parliament for a no-deal Brexit. And the government should now be working with the majority in Parliament, not with one side. And, of course, there's a big vote next week when the government is going to seek to put on the face of the bill the date of Brexit, 29th of March, yeah. uh, 2019. Well, I mean, the other thing to take away is there was a lot of intra-Tory party hostility today, wasn't there? Not a lot of love in the room between the two sides there, between the rebels. A lot of anger with the rebels. There is absolute fury within government with Dominic Grieve. I spoke to one minister at the heart of all this who said to me, Dominic Grieve will feel the chilling hangover of what he has done. And what he has done is he has weakened the Prime Minister on the eve of a European Council in summit, uh, European Council in Brussels tomorrow. Uh, and this minister said to me, there are now two options. One, it's not worth the candle. Let's just let Dominic Grieve's amendment uh, pass. The second option is to say to Dominic Grieve, you said earlier today that if your amendment is accepted, you will agree to have a negotiation with us at a later stage, at the report stage, about a compromise in which both sides can be happy. Presumably, your offer still stands. Well, let's talk to my, uh, political, let's talk to my political guests and Dominic Grieve, who's been talked about while sitting there very patiently. Uh, the knives are really pretty well out for you, aren't they? I rather doubt it. I'm not very concerned about knives being out for me. I'm in Parliament to do my duty by my constituents and by my country. Uh, 
knives can be anywhere, I'm not going to be bothered by that in any way at all. Right. What I am is intent on trying to support the government in doing the right thing. And the right thing is carrying out Brexit in an orderly, sensible way, which has a proper process to it, and which enables the right decisions to be made at the right time. Right. And that's what I will continue to do. Uh, I'm sorry to hear if colleagues uh, think so ill of me, uh, uh, but it's not going to affect what I do right. one no. shot. And, and you will vote next week against this idea of having a fixed legal date for Brexit. In, I hope very much it won't be necessary, because but, but if the government comes against, back with that yeah. date, I, I'm sure the government will be defeated, and I have no desire to defeat the government or be involved in the okay. government's defeat a second time. I've been in Parliament for 20 years, and apart from HS2, I don't think I've ever rebelled before. Are you ready? Are you open to kind of negotiation and a compromise on this whole issue of the way the votes are handled? I, 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 not only am I open to negotiation, my whole life is negotiation. Right. I tabled these amendments over a month ago. I've had a very sensible dialogue with government ministers about what their purpose is, sometimes probing, sometimes teasing out, sometimes trying to point out flaws. And so far, until this evening, we'd always managed sensible outcomes, which I thought improved the legislation and kept everybody broadly happy. I'm sorry that the negotiations foundered. It was a spectacular foundering, I can't deny that. And the points that were just made a uh, moment ago, that there appears to have been a complete breakdown within government as to how to uh, answer perfectly legitimate points uh, is slightly worrying, but I've no doubt people will learn from the experience. And I also noted that I had colleagues uh, who were indeed Brexiters or were much more supportive of the government who were pointing out that the legislation was in a very bad condition and couldn't right. be allowed to stay in the condition it was in. You know that the, 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 the Brexiteers and the government think all of this is just basically a backdoor way of giving MPs the chance to impose a soft Brexit, something closer to Norway, if the government comes back with something closer to Canada. Is that, that is possible because you now have that, if you like, veto power at a late stage in the process, the correct exact, or not? The exact terms of Brexit are a matter for negotiation for the government. It's right, and I've said this on many occasions, that I will not have the closing down of options. Right. So, but and, does and this, some does of this the impression the, yeah, does we've had is of options being closed down, and that's this, unacceptable to does, me. Does this leave the op Does this make a, a, a soft Brexit more likely? That is the question. Is it meaningful in that sense or not? I think you may be misreading this. This bill is about process, not yeah, outcome. But, but you know, now it's true that process matters. But this bill is about how you carry out the process rather than the negotiation itself. I've been studious in not trying to interfere with the government's negotiating strategy. I've hardly asked a question because I think, in fact, Parliament's ability to interfere with the negotiating strategy is rather limited. That said, I am very much of yeah. the view that it is in the country's interest that we keep a close relationship with the EU or we're going to suffer serious economic okay. consequences. Look. So I would like to have a Brexit which minimises yeah. risk and maximises opportunity. We know, we, know, we know where you are on Brexit. Let me turn to Bernard Jenkins. I know the two of you don't want to have a, a sort of on-air, blue-on-blue fight right here in the studio. Um, can I ask we you... We wouldn't fight too well. <laughs> do you know each other far Bernard too well and get on far Bernard too well? Jenkin, do you think this makes gives MPs some backdoor way of imposing a kind of a softer version of Brexit if they want to. Well, I mean, you heard from Nick's account that obviously some people think it does. Right, does but it? Actually, Do it really doesn't change the price of fish very much. I mean, Dominic's been very um, frank, actually, that this is really only about how you implement the withdrawal well, then agreement. Well, why the big fuss about it? Why and, didn't the government concede um, it? If and, it doesn't um, change the direction of the thing, uh, um, what's uh, the problem? And, well, what it means is, uh, because these powers will now not be available to the government to use until another Act of Parliament has been passed, it may mean that we have to pass a, an extra Act of Parliament very late in the day right. at very top speed. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily better but parliamentary come on, scrutiny. The... But, I mean, you know, it's, it's life. I mean, the problem is that the, um, the Act of Parliament that actually implements the withdrawal agreement may not finish going through Parliament until after we've left. So, you know, this is all very complicated well, and all very can, obscure. But um, uh, I think what was sad was that, uh, however clumsily, the government was offering concessions at the last minute and, and uh, some of the rebels were just shouting, oh, too late, too late, which but, sounded just a but, little petulant. But, how many times have you voted 
mm. against a Conservative government. As I should think I've uh, probably scores of times. Yeah. And I, I so don't, bit, isn't I, it a bit I, rich to sort I, of no, I, to be not, haranguing the people who vote against the I, government? I on wasn't the haranguing anybody today. Uh, I was engaging in some right. honest debate. So you I disagree respect, with Nadine Doris, uh, who said they should be deselected and never allowed to stand as an MP uh, again? I'm afraid I do. I don't think that's very helpful. Right. But I mean, the different difference is um, um, I rebelled to try and get a referendum. I rebelled um, years and years ago on the Maastricht Treaty, again, when they refused to have a referendum. And I rebelled when powers were being taken away from Parliament, which wouldn't touch the ground when legislation so, was being made in this country. All these powers are answerable to Parliament, amendable, revocable, controllable by Parliament, and, is it, and, and ultimately they're only temporary, and it's sanctioned by a referendum right. that we've had. If, if, it's the right MPs, situation. if the majority of MPs took the view that they wanted a softer Brexit than the one currently being talked about, is it legitimate for them to impose that? on the government, if some parliamentary well, way of doing that can be found. Well, is that legitimate? Everybody voted for Article 50, well, nearly everybody voted yeah. for the Article 50. But they 50, might take a different view is, about what which it Which is, the reality is, you negotiate a, um, you try to negotiate a withdrawal agreement and a free trade agreement, uh, but ultimately, if, a, if, if an acceptable arrangement doesn't emerge from the negotiations, you're still leaving, you've still got to leave. Now, I personally don't want that, I hope we get the agreement. Some people are trying to reverse the, the, the I mean, you're going to hear this new phrase, Brexinos, people who want Brexit in name only. This is the kind of Norway option where we still are, have all the regulation of the EU imposed right. upon us, and we we can't. We're not free to do trade deals with other countries. We haven't really Understood. taken back control of our own laws. I think that would be. Uh, some people need call to. that soft Brexit. I think Theresa May calls that not we, Brexit we, at all. We really do need to leave it there. Look, thank, thank you both very much indeed for coming in. Steve Richards, Claire Fox, plenty to say on tonight's headlines, including this one in the Times, Revenge of the Rebels, the 11 Tories who have, what, what have they done, thwarted Brexit? What do you think they've uh, achieved? No, they are arguing that what they need is a final significant vote to have Parliament assess Brexit. And um, I think some of us are rather cynical about this um, as their motives. Um, I, I, I did want to read, I know this is a paper review, but I just want to read one tweet from uh, Lord Andrew Adonis, who says, first step towards defeat of Brexit, and this is before the Lords are, have got going on the National Betrayal Bill. So when people uh, wonder why I and many Brexit people are concerned that what this is about is thwarting Brexit, it's because people like Lord Adonis tell me that's what it's about, and so I, that's my concern. Um, this is definitely humiliating for Theresa May. I do not admire um, these rebels because I think that they are potentially undermining the, mm -hmm. uh, the will of the people in, in, in character, characteristic fashion. I quite like rebels. Do they rebels. need to be named and shamed again, though, do you think? Well, I think they've named... They've na it's not it's named and shamed, and they've named themselves. And, I mean, it, it, this is it's interesting. We, we were actually talking in the break, weren't we? This is not quite as savage as the male has been, actually. Are you proud of yourself? It has shown their pictures, but goodness knows, most of those people are never off the telly telling us what they think about how bad Brexit is, so it's hardly like a shocker from the locker that they're there, right? Anyway, Steve. <laughs> the, yeah. I mean, the fact that people like Andrew Adonis have tweeted, uh, I mean, us Remainers have not had much to be excited about, so the, uh, the odd vote here and there, I think uh, a kind of a bit of excitement is, is, is justified. But, I mean, on one level, <clears throat> I've always been of the view that there would be a significant vote in the House of Commons on the deal. You couldn't have a moment of such historic uh, importance uh, without the House of Commons being v voting on it in, in a way that mattered. But this does show and remind us that Brexit is being driven through a hung parliament yep. and that there will be <clears throat> moments when parliament tries to take control and there's nothing or very little the government can do about it. In this case, I think they might have been able to do something about it. Those rebels on the front page of the Daily Mail mm -hmm. all said in their that. speeches that they tried to have many conversations mm -hmm. with the government about sorting this um, to avoid them rebelling. Most of them are not natural rebels, actually. Um, and I think uh, Dominic Grieve, who kind of led this, uh, said uh, it's only the second time he's ever rebelled and the first time was to do with a local constituency matter. So we're not dealing here with kind of 
the Russian Revolution. You know, these are people who are not natural re 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 rebellion. Maybe it could have been dealt with. But the Commons has mm. taken control tonight, and I think that is significant. So what is the concern when you see uh, papers like The Eye calling it um, bruising, The Guardian, which calls it humiliating, and The Telegraph, which talks about the mutiny? Is the problem that when they have this meaningful vote, they have, in fact, handed a veto to Parliament. Is that the big concern for those like Claire who support Brexit? Yeah, I think it's... it's, it's and, and also it forces uh, certain timetable changes. <coughs> it means that Theresa May goes to uh, Brussels tomorrow having had this kind of defeat. So already, you know, one of the things the EU has shown since uh, Brexit is, is that what it wants to do is to humiliate Britain to a certain extent. I mean, there's been Yeah, but Guy quite von Hofstadt, a... who's the Parliament spokesman on this matter, says MEPs have voted to endorse um, the deal and the British Parliament has voted to have a say in it. Democracy wins. Yes, I'm sure he did. Um, so what I'm saying is... <laughs> as a, what I'm saying is the reason why people are noticing that this is potentially going to weaken mm. Theresa May in negotiations is because it might. And goodness knows they've not exactly had a strong hand. So I understand that there are concerns. I was concerned, of course, about the deal that was done last week as a fudge. It's not as though I was kind of singing and rejoicing when the deal went through. Mm. There's a lot of kind of backtracking. You're absolutely right. A hung parliament in these circumstances not great but the, the big historic moment which we've just all noted I think that's the thing that it's a very important thing that Britain has decided to do and it is right that people are concerned to both scrutinize it but it is entirely appropriate for the electorate not the Westminster bubble but the electorate who put that Westminster bubble in there to be cynical and skeptical about the possibility that there are people playing politics party politics and Westminster bubbly politics to undermine what was decided so and I've not made that you know I'm not this is not a kind of oh, hard Brexit point this is a constant stream or, as they say, ultra remain is reminding us that that's what they want to do. So. <clears throat> but, I mean, obviously one of the problems with the referendum was it was just an in or out question. Yes. What form it would take, it was going to be left to yes. uh, Parliament. And it's Parliament or the executive, see, that's the point here, though, isn't it? Well... No, in the end, Parliament. I mean, they, they well, were... only because they fought to have a say yeah. Yeah, at but, every but, stage. Well, I think yeah. they have a right to have a say, yeah. and um, it is a, the, head, the Telegraph thing is a good dramatic headline <coughs> which highlights <coughs> Theresa May's extraordinary period. You know, historians will look back at these last ten days, uh, mutiny in Commons as she sets sail for key Brussels talks. You know, she, she sort of, kind of interesting in spite of herself. Really, she's astonishing. The precarious nightmare early last week the sort of then she looks strong and now she's weak again I mean it is astonishing but basically however dogged she is the broader position is weak she's a prime minister in a hung parliament mm. and the focus so far has been um, internal divisions whether she can keep the DUP on board but that House of Commons can if it uh, unites uh, around different forms of Brexit defeat her so if we go inside the <clears throat> Daily Mail, apologies this isn't on one page, coalition of the, if you read it with me, disgruntled, we'll get there <laughs> in the end. Um, they, the next point of contact for her and uh, what she's trying to deliver, which is to be all things to all members of her party, is this fixed date of Brexit in March 2019. And these rebels um, are already not saying whether or not they're going to try and defeat her on that as well. So will she quietly drop that, do you think? Is that a sop to the Brexiteers and her party to say, I'm with you on this, we will have an exit date? Good. Uh, yeah, uh, no, just very, very quickly, that. Yeah. Uh, you've conjured up one of her nightmares. I've heard these rebels in the past say they find that idea wholly unacceptable. It's holding a gun to your own it. head, is it? Be, is that in the, effect, is that because the kind of there might be more detail that needs a few more days or weeks, why trap yourself yeah. with this well, guillotine yourself and but that is what she offered and so to withdraw it would be a sign of weakness these are the kind of traps that prime ministers get into facing mountainous kind of challenges in a hung parliament but it's, in, it's uh, interesting here i mean you know quinton let the great mm -hmm. cooking of a ruse to keep us mired in the eu glue pit but um <laughs> labor's kate hoey obviously a, a, a labor uh, brexit yeah. uh, supporter uh, cut through the bluster to describe yesterday's uh, uh, commons debate as lawyer versus lawyer and i think there's a sort of also a sense that one of the things that's happened here is that brexit has been turned into the very thing that one dreads if you are a Brexiteer, actually, which is 
technocratic, bureaucratic yeah. wrangling instead of, um, and, and those of us who might have wanted a cleaner Brexit, um, instead of it having sort of some sense. And the point about well, this kind of like... Well, it's attorney generals joining forces, but it's also, it? But it's also this, the, Yes, Dominic exactly. But, and the, it's the machinations of the kind of legalistic teams. Yes, we've defeated them, we've got these through. You don't feel as though it's a great day for democracy. That's the point I'm making. Democracy has been well served by the way I think that people took the referendum seriously, whether or not it was a, a, a binary decision. And I just worry about it just being, you know, great, we've stopped it, we can throw this bit into the pot, the lawyers are in. And that's what the negotiations have been but like. I'm afraid one annoying. of the inevitable consequences of Brexit is it's a field day for lawyers. And I don't say that in a scathing way. Yes. There is no way round it. Uh, decoupling from the most complex set of uh, engagements uh, needs probably more lawyers than we've even yes, contemplated. Yes, and undoubtedly they've the got economy. a technical <laughs> skill over here, but we're talking yeah. about them as parliamentarians, and when Parliament starts to sound more like a law chamber, I worry, that's all okay. I'm saying. Yep. Okay.